Good morning, sub tours. We are all about trust today. We've, uh, we've got our real estate expert, Mr. Bronchick here today. We're going to talk about trust. If you guys have any questions, now is the time. So we'll be back in 45 seconds. <laughs> Good morning, Deed Grabbers. It is Thursday, and you know what that means. Time for Goat Talk. Uh, that's our weekly Facebook Live that we do on creative real estate and all real estate, really. Uh, if you're here with us this morning, we appreciate you. We'd like to ask you to subscribe to our YouTube channel at sub2tv.com. We release videos almost every day of the week on some real estate related topic. And if you're looking for what I guarantee you, is the most affordable real estate training on the planet. You check us out at seven dollar coaching, seven bucks a month. And I'll ask answer your questions every week, uh, along with hundreds of other real seven estate dollars. investors. So uh, get over there, get signed up. We're not going to waste any time this morning. We're going to go ahead and bring in uh, my pal and real estate expert, Mr. Bill Bronch. Good morning, Bill. How are you? Good morning, William. How are you? Man, we're finer than frog hair here in Northwest Arkansas today. Um, we got you in here this morning. I always love to talk to you, but man, I'm getting so many trust questions um, lately, it seems like. Uh, and I know you're the expert. I learned everything about trust from you years ago, and, and it served me very well. Tell everybody, maybe if there's somebody on here, can't imagine there is, might be somebody in here that hadn't heard of you. Tell everybody about you and what you do. All right. Well, I've been a a real estate attorney practicing for 32 years, a practicing full-time real estate investor for 30 years. I've written uh, six published books, three bestsellers, uh, appeared on numerous media outlets, TV media, magazines, newspapers, et cetera. And actually on trusts, I actually teach a continuing leg legal education course for attorneys on trusts. Um, and as well, I teach at a Bible college in Colorado on real estate and business law. So those are my credentials, you know, <laughs> awesome. Okay. Fantastic. I know when I got started investing, I was lucky enough to, to go to a seminar and, and meet Bill and, and get a lot of his products and man, it really just changed. I, and I, I say this all the time. I'll say it again. A large part of my success has been due to this gentleman. So Thank I'm you. proud to know him and recommend him to, uh, to the people that, Thank you that follow us. Uh, if you're here on here with us, say good morning. Let us know where you are. Oren, good to see you. Oren's a Mac student that uh, actually he he uh, got me uh, on inviting you here for this today. Oren has some trust questions. So we're doing doing this special event here today for Oren. So uh, he's the man of the hour today. Uh, Jen and Brad, good to see you guys. Phil, lots of people have trust issues lately. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Uh, so if you got some questions, throw them in here. We're going to get started with some basic stuff here. Uh, some of the most popular stuff that that I get. And number one, uh, are trust legal everywhere? I just had somebody else last week tell me an attorney said you can't use trust in my state. I think it was Kansas. They're not legal. We don't recognize them. What What's the story on that? Well, he's just uninformed. Um, mm -hmm. Well, trusts, what depends what kind we're talking about. You know, every state has trust law uh, mm -hmm. at two levels. One is what's called the, the probate code, and there's what's called the uniform probate code, which governs trusts from state to state. And when they call it, say, uniform, that means everybody adopted it in you know 99% with a few tweaks. So a trust may be created for any lawful purpose. That's the basics of the uniform probate code, right? Mm -hmm. uh, also, there's common law. Common law is... is court decisions um, that generate a body of law, like things like, you know, an offer and an acceptance makes a contract. That's not codified in a particular state statute. That's just common law. 
Um, and common law recognizes that trust may be created for a variety of purposes. What they're talking about specifically land trust, which is a form of revocable living trust used to hold title to a property for privacy. Um, been around for a long, long, long time, started in Illinois. And it, there's a state statute authorizing and defining and, and, and uh, codifying land trusts in about nine states. Um, other states have specific court decisions like California that say, you know, land trust is valid here. Um, other states don't say anything one way or the other. And therefore, attorneys and title companies and brokers and things will tell you, you know, we don't recognize those here. That's not true. That's not true. Um, there's only been two court decisions that said we don't recognize them here. And that's one in Louisiana, one in Tennessee. And it was a fight over probate and jurisdiction. Uh, you know, the, I, I don't want to get into the, the micro details of that. Right. But for the most part, you know, uh, you know, the Uniform Probate Code and common law and court decisions recognize trusts in, in 48 out of 50 states, either explicitly or, you know, um, um, just by common law. So what you're saying is, what I hear you saying is, if I want to take title in a trust mm -hmm. in any state, I can mm -hmm. do that. Yeah, it's not illegal. Like even in Tennessee and Louisiana, um, it's not. you're not going to go to jail for using one. It's not illegal in the sense that it's a crime. Um, it's just that they won't recognize its validity for, for this purpose or that, mm -hmm. depending on what it is. And the whole point of trust, of course, we know is anonymity. If you're in a court room arguing over whether this is a valid trust it's it's a moot point right <laughs> your cover is busted um mm -hmm. it's not like you know you go to jail it's just that the trust fails to exist as an end as as a concern as a contract mm -hmm. and then the beneficiary is you know who's that going to be an llc or something or you right. or something else right so what that it comes down to those you and i i mean you've been investing for gosh how many years now 30 mm -hmm. 30. I mean, I've, I've only been doing it for 23, but I know for a okay. fact, my experience on it is you will get sued at some point in real estate investing, whether yeah. it's a tenant or whoever, but that happens very rarely in, in the big yeah. picture, usually if you're halfway ethical anyway. Right. So, so most of the time it's kind of like cheating on your taxes. You can cheat on your taxes all you want. It doesn't matter unless you get audited. Right, right. <laughs> Right. The difference between cheating and being creative, you know. You know, you know what I'm saying. That's amazing. Well, the point of the point of the land trust is is by being anonymous, mm -hmm. you 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 weed out ninety percent of litigation because most right. of them are just amateurs or frivolous stuff. And if a tenant looks up the owner of the land at the county records and mm -hmm. sees a trust at a PO box as an address and doesn't know where to go, and right. that trust is not named after you, and the trustee is not you, someone with different mm -hmm. last name, it's very hard for them to, to poke around. If they go to an attorney, a 1-800, you know, slime bag attorney, um, you know, they get a lot, a lot of calls and, you know, right. from their advertisements, and they have a low-level attorney screening hundreds of them every week, and you've got about 45 seconds to convince that attorney that there's something here and you're not a cook. Um, and if they see complex, like we don't know who the owner is and it's a trust, it's anonymous, then that law firm is likely to say, we're not taking the case on a free sort of contingency basis. You got to pay by the hour. And most people can't afford that. And, right. and that's the game. That's the game we're playing. Yeah. Okay. So, and, and, you know, just on that point, uh, I said this to somebody else the other day, but it, it, it's valid here, you know, they say that one of the reasons that so many attorneys, oh, we don't do that here. They just don't understand it. And, not I, not and I never, I didn't yeah. learn that lesson. I mean, completely until my divorce. Right. When, when I'm sitting at this conference table, 20 feet long, and all the partners are coming in to listen to my deposition because they don't understand where all the real right. estate is or how the trusts work or anything. So I got right. to teach real estate law to, to some pretty expensive attorneys right. that day. Yeah, uh, I've done that before. I mean, I've had like, for example, contracts for deed, mm -hmm. where you sell a property on a contract, you keep title right. in the seller's name. Um, people do it in all 50 states, but only about half of them recognize it by statute. So mm -hmm. I've had the same thing. I do, I've been doing it in Colorado for since 1997. I've probably mm -hmm. closed 1,500 of them. Right. And 90% of attorneys in Colorado will tell you, we don't do contracts for deed in Colorado. <laughs> they're not legal here. And I've done like 1,500 of them. You know, what do you mean right. they're not legal here? But there's been court decisions you know, litigating about them, saying and you know, recognizing them, 
mm-hmm. there's no state statute that says this is what a contract for deed is and this is how you get somebody out. Right. So okay. So again, you know, powers and knowledge and no one else can do. No the difference when a lawyer says this is not legal here. What he's mm-hmm. saying is is that it's not that it's illegal, like you're gonna go to jail, but he says there's no specific law or statute that's that defines what it is or recognizes what it is. That doesn't mean it's not valid or usable in the state. It just says there's no recognized authority they can look to that says this is what it is. Right. So so what everybody needs to do is go out and find an attorney. Like I was lucky enough to find when I got started uh, and I sat down with him and told him all the things I wanted to do. He was this old guy. I'm, I'm talking one of these old guys with the mustache that's got the nicotine stains in it. You know, <laughs> And I said, can I do this, this, and this? And I threw a lot of wild creative stuff out at him. And he's like, well, I don't see why not. Let's try it and see what happens. Oh, you know? Well, that's good. That's good. <laughs> but most attorneys would say no. Maybe because most, most attorneys are going to give you just enough advice to keep you from suing them for malpractice. Right. And that's why you know, attorneys don't want you to do wild things. They want to keep you on the straight and narrow because mm-hmm. if you screw up, then you're going to blame them. Yeah, for sure. Uh, got some guys jumping on here this morning. Hey, Allie, good to see you. Carlos, Jeff, Melissa, good to see all of you guys in here this morning. Y'all let us have your questions. Uh, Bill's going to answer all of them. He's these high paid guys. So you got him here for free this morning. You better, you better ask him why you can. Uh, my next question, this, this is another one. Who is the best trustee for your trust? Who should you get to be your trustee? Well, ideally it's a friend or relative with a different last name. Mm-hmm. ideally someone who lives out of state. Right. Although, you know, we used to say out of state with a P.O. box out of state because the mm-hmm. harder it is to get process of a summons on someone, the, hard, the, the more likely, you know, the free contingency attorney is going to give up and say, sorry, mm-hmm. you got to pay me by the hour. Mm-hmm. Uh, but now they have something called virtual P.O. boxes. Right. Um, you Google them, there's about 10 companies doing them for about, you know, eight to 10 bucks a month right. where you can have like your neighbor be your trustee and have a virtual PO box in Alaska. Mm-hmm. And they, if you get nailed, they'll scan it and email it to you. Right. So <laughs> it's right. beautiful. Um, yeah. you know, and, and they don't have to be in the United States. If you're from India and you, your cousin from India wants to be the trustee, there's nothing wrong with that. What I like about trust is so if you hold title in an LLC directly, you need a registered or resident agent in that state, which is a physical address where you could serve someone with legal papers. That's the purpose right. of a registered agent. Mm-hmm. A trust does not need one. Mm-hmm. It could be at a PO box and it could be out of the state. So mm-hmm. logistically, the harder it is to get information, to get service of a summons or a subpoena on someone, the more likely someone's going to give up if they don't have a really, really you know, damaging case. If it's just something, you know, moderate or frivolous they're going to get right so so how how much trouble is that i mean let's really talk about that for a second if you own a property and you have it in a trust and you have a trustee let's just say that let's let's take one of my students with a with a his name he's on here today phil smith if i've got phil smith as my trustee with a p.o box in california Mm -hmm. and someone says oh i need to sue uh, this, this prop, whatever they're, they're going, they go to you as an attorney and you look it up and, and it's in a trust. Phil Smith's the trustee. He's has a PO box in California. What have you got to do to mm-hmm. find him and get him and get something done? It's a lot of trouble, isn't it? Well, the first thing I'd probably do is send a letter mm-hmm. to the PO box and just say, Hey, we got a potential claim here. Contact whoever's in charge and get the insurance involved so I can make a claim. Um, that's the first thing. And Phil would probably just ignore it mm-hmm. uh, or just let you know that trouble's coming. Right. Uh, if I actually wanted to start a lawsuit, uh, I'd have to file a summons and complaint and then get a process server in California to find where this person lives. Because how are you going to serve someone at a P.O. box? Right. Now, if I can't get service on them, I can't find them, then I can ask the court for permission to serve by mail, by P.O. box mm-hmm. or by publication, publishing a notice in the county newspaper where the trustee lives, the the court would probably require both, Mm -hmm. you know, a mailing address. Right. Um, Or, you know, you maybe you tell your trustee right back, uh, sorry, I can't reveal who the beneficiaries are, but I'll pass on any information that you want. Mm -hmm. Just, just so they don't say, well, I tried to mail and and they didn't respond. So I want to publish in the paper, which you wouldn't get notice of. And that's bad because they, you know, you can get a default judgment 
right. against the trust. Mm -hmm. So all of that would have to take place. And, and what we're really saying here is that most uh, uh, contingency fee lawyers are going to go, I'm not going yeah, to that trouble. No, if you've got five yeah. grand to retain me, yeah, I'll do yeah, something. Exactly. That, yeah. And it, it's a game we're playing yeah. here. It's like football, right? We're, being, we're on defense and mm -hmm. the other guy needs a quarterback. So right. if we take out the quarterback, Mm -hmm. And he can't play, you know, right. play a little dirty, you know, in, in yeah. football where you clip him in the back of the knee and take him mm -hmm. out on an injury, you know, mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> figuratively speaking. <laughs> right. If so back, they forfeit the game. Right. So worst case scenario, I don't have anybody. Uh, can I be my own trustee? You could, but that defeats the purpose of it. Doesn't it? If you, you just put your name out there, then everybody's yeah, sort of the, the whole idea is to confuse. So a mm -hmm. tenant dealing with you and you're telling them you're the property manager, not the owner. And mm -hmm. they look up the owner in the tax records and it says XYZ Trust, PO Box, care of Phil Smith, PO Box, California. Oh, William's mm -hmm. not the owner. It's some trust. Mm -hmm. So where do I go? Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, I've got a question here, Jack said, I've been using trust for 20 years. We still have a huge problem with title companies not allowing us to close in a trust. Yeah. And I yeah. use revocable living trust. That, that's, that's the practical issue. Mm -hmm. In some states, well, even in my state of Colorado, where there's no statute uh, mm -hmm. or court cases, there's one subtle court case that mentions land trusts. Um, but a lot of title companies are saying their underwriters don't like land trusts and they won't ensure the buyer is a land trust. Right. Um, so, um, and uh, states like uh, Pennsylvania, there's a little issue with transferring the trust. So what we do is I have an alternative form of land trust that looks and smells more like a living trust. Mm -hmm. And I use that and I give it to them right. and they go, okay, fine, we'll insure it. And then after the closing, I do an amendment to the trust, turning it back into what's more mm -hmm. Okay. And that's not recorded anywhere. So, yeah. you know, it's a, a trust is a contract. It's not like an LLC where you have to file anything anyway. Right. Okay. All well, right. That's, so, that's the, sometimes it's, you know, obviously when you're buying or selling, um, you know, one of the important tips is uh, you pick the title company. When you're selling, yeah. it's customary the seller picks it. Right. When you're buying, you could put in the contract, we got to use my title company and right. be willing to pay for the closing fee for that privilege. That way you don't get an argument and try to educate a new title company every time you're the buyer with a seller's different title company. Right. It's so important to have your people that you can go to and get this yeah. stuff done. Yeah. Um, because so many will say no. Yeah. Probably sure. eight out of time, 10 title companies in my state won't do it. But mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't matter. I have two or three that will. So I insist on doing that. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see. Question. Is it okay to buy in seller um, financing with your name and then deed over to a trust? To buy in, with a seller financing? I'm not sure what uh, in seller FI, I'm not sure what that means. Let us give us a little bit more information on that one so we can answer that accurately. Um, Let's see. Steve says, wondering if it's better to rate either another trust or LLC to act as your trustee so you can sign as the partner of an LLC providing trustee services. Yeah. Um, well, again, the reason for having an individual at a P.O. box is it makes it logistically difficult to get process of, of a summons on. So let's say you make an LLC your trustee and you take title in XYG Trust, care of ABC LLC um, 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 trustee, and here's the address. Okay, that your name's not on the deed. Okay, mm -hmm. but they could look up the LLC with Secretary of State, find the registered agent, and serve right. the trustee. Now, if you file the LLC through a service or an attorney where your name's not of public record, it's a possible alternative. Mm -hmm. It's a viable alternative. Right. Okay. But, you see, but people say that I go to California and I say, have a friend or relative be a trustee. And they go, I don't have anyone I trust. And go, well, you know, that's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> that's for sure. You know, on that topic, and I've got this question for later, but 
What about the Rena trustee? I, I've seen some. Uh, I don't know if they're gurus or their teachers, whatever. But they say, I'll be your trustee, your initial trustee for a fee. And then, of course, they do the assignment and everything after the fact. What about that? I mean, is that a uh, do you act as trustee for some people? Uh, I've done it. I, to be honest, I've regretted it. Right. OK. I don't want the responsibility right. or the liability. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I usually have an indemnity clause that says if I get sued as trustee, you have to pay for my lawyer to extricate me out of the case. Right. Um, cause I really don't want to do it, um, because they mail forward and I got to re be responsible right. for mail forwarding. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, there are services that do it, but, you know, if you go to a bank and go to a trust company, they're going to charge you like $400 a year per trust. That's right. crazy. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, there are individual companies, like you said, that do it for maybe a hundred or two a year. Mm -hmm. Um, that's, if you have 10 properties, that's pretty pricey. Yeah, that's for sure. So your ultimately your recommendation. Well, first of all, if you don't have anyone you trust to be trustee for ten minutes, you got some issues. But right. otherwise, it, it's, yeah, it's for ten minutes that means you put the deed with a trustee on it, and then they resign. Mm -hmm. So they're just on record. Right. But the problem is, is that if someone mails, they're going to mail with that person. Yeah. Unless you control the PO box you set up. Mm -hmm with like a virtual P.O. box. That, that's a possible option. So you say to your cousin, look, be trusty on record at this P.O. box that I, I'll i control virtually and, mm -hmm. and then sign a resignation affidavit five minutes after I record the deed. And then if they mail something, they'll mail it to that P.O. box and then they'll forward it to me and I'll deal with it. I mean, the reality is I, I tell people, you know, who set up trust, like clients and they have a friend or relative who's a trustee, mm -hmm. they have no liability. They have no responsibility. They're not going to manage, collect rents, make decisions. The only thing they're going to have to do is sign a closing package when they go to sell. Right. That's it. Yep. So there's not much to it. Yeah. There's not much to it. In terms of trust, what can the trustee really do without you? Yeah. I and mean, and most, most of the time, they don't know what's happening anyway, really. They don't know what's happening. Look, let's say Phil Smith was your trustee in California, William. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to sign a quit claim deed to another investor in California to buy your property. Wouldn't right. that investor want to get in the house first? And how would they get in the house without William? Right. So it's very unlikely. I've never really seen this happen. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's see. Uh, Facebook user, what are the steps to set up a land trust? Can a title company set it up or get an attorney to do it? Can I do it myself? A uh, title company won't do it, except if you're in Illinois, they do it. Uh, land, um, Chicago Title in Illinois invented this, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, they invented the land trust in the 1950s as a way of being anonymous, and Chicago Title would charge a trustee fee every year. So in Cook County, Illinois, Chicago, about 40% of properties are in land trusts. That's so amazing. Very common. Yeah. Um, but um, the question is, how do you set it up? It's a trust agreement. It's not an entity like an LLC where you file it. It's just a contract, like a living trust. You mm -hmm. sign it. The creator of the trust, the grantor, the trustee signs it. And then you transfer ownership of the property to the trust by a deed. That's the, the gist of it. A couple of little technicalities, but that's the gist of it. Um, you can have an attorney do it. Sure. Mm -hmm. I do it for clients all the time. Um, you know, there's some people like me who have kids. You can do it yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not terribly expensive or difficult um, or a combination. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times I have clients who come to me and say, set me up a corporate structure for my properties. And I have 17 houses. And I said, do you really want to pay me 17 times to do a land trust? I said, why don't I just do two land trusts and two deeds and you just, I'll give you the form and just, cut and paste the legal descriptions and the address. Exactly. Uh, and, and then fine with that. Yeah. And I just want to tell you guys, you can get Bill's program that I got started with and, and, and did just what he said. All the documents are there, everything you need uh, to know about trust and to set them up. And you just go to sub 2 and it'll take you right there and you can get it. So. Look at that. You got a little ink already. Thank Listen, you. man, I'm fancy. I'm fancy now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So get over there and get that. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a great investment. Uh, let's see. Matt asks, it's kind of like people who text people and then put the name of the LLC. It's an easy way to get sued. I always say just a basic name when texting so you can't be tracked. Huh? 
Oh, you're talking about for the tax market. <laughs> so, uh, wow, we got some some spammers in here, I guess. Let's see. I thought I did New it. adult dating. But I guess not. Yeah. How is that? I've never seen that before. Oh yeah. If you're if you're on YouTube. Uh, it happens from time to time. Maybe I can get my producer to take care of these for me because there's some kind of error. I can't seem to block them. So uh, anyway, wow. uh, let's see. Jason, what uh, a qualified trust attorney charge for putting a property in trust, title insurance cost. So, uh, you know, I charge usually about five to seven hundred dollars, depending on the complexity of it. Mm -hmm. There are attorneys I've seen charge as much as twelve to fifteen hundred dollars. In terms of title insurance, I don't really think that's necessary. If you already own the property and you're putting it into a trust, your title policy covered you up to the point of when you bought it. It just doesn't cover that gap from when you bought it up till the time you transferred it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you could theoretically go to your title company and say, can you amend the policy and do a rider, you know, covering the gap and they would charge you, but... Mm -hmm. I think a risk versus cost is silly. Now, if you're buying directly in a trust as a buyer, that's different. Obviously, mm -hmm. it's just whatever title policy would be. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think we got some clarity on this question. The seller financing the loan amount to an individual to take title, then sell or change title to trust. I think oh. what she's asking is, yeah, is can you buy with seller financing and then just deed it into a trust yourself? I think what she's saying is she's – seller financing it to an individual to take title. Well, I'm not sure, actually, mm -hmm. uh, buyer or seller here. Either way, it doesn't matter. The answer is yes. You can always transfer title. If you have title to the property, you can transfer it to a trust, whether you're seller or buyer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I recently spoke with a lawyer who said it is better legally to do an assignment and assumption instead of a sub two because a sub two is more risky. What is your opinion? Um, it's not really trust related, but what's your, what's your for home <laughs> risky for whom? If I'm the buyer, assuming it is risky for me. Right. If I don't I'm think two is risky at all, but, uh, right. Well, instead of, if I'm a seller, I wouldn't, and it was my loan. I mm -hmm. would really, really reluctant to let someone take subject to my loan. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. Right. Why people do it in divorce all the time. If you think about it, William, you know, mm -hmm. husband and wife on the loan, they get divorced. Husband quit claims it to the wife. She promises to sell or refi within three years. Mm -hmm. A year later, she defaults. Husband's out of luck. Right. Oh, you know, it's interesting you say that. We had a situation yesterday. We're out door knocking at foreclosures and uh, tenants are in the house. They've been paying for two and a half years renting. Uh, Found out recently the house is in foreclosure. The the couple that owned it got a divorce. It went to the wife, and she's just been taking all the rent money. She's she's letting it go back to the bank. So now they're getting evicted. Yeah, it, it's it's tough. You're saying like who would do that in their right mind? <laughs> Every day of the week. Lawyer, Every day. The lawyer who allowed this for the husband should be sued yeah. for malpractice. Yeah, that's that's for sure. Uh, let's see. Owen has got a question. Uh, if the beneficiary is an LLC. Which state would you recommend to open it? Uh, I'll give you the lawyer answer. It depends. Yeah. Um, if the property's in Alabama, then probably in Alabama LLC. Mm -hmm. Probably. Yeah. Uh, for some reason, a lot of people, and I, I know that they hear this from other people, that they need to have a Nevada or a Wyoming LLC mm -hmm. and those things, and that's where they need to hold everything. Right. Well, if you layer entities like I recommend, so if you have five properties and five trusts and three, let's say three to five LLCs there in the state where the property is, and then have all those LLCs in turn um, owned by a parent company in Wyoming, yeah, you get protection that way. Uh, but not every entity has to be in Wyoming. And I really don't like Nevada unless you live in Nevada because it's a very mm -hmm. expensive state. Right. Okay. I know you're having a creative finance workshop. Are you going to talk about some of these things at that workshop? And when is that coming up, Bill? It's coming up. Uh, it's November 11th and 12th. It's a mm -hmm. Friday evening, Saturday morning. Um, and it's called recession proof real estate investing. Okay. So it's 
what's working now and in the future and right. no matter what the market is doing. And one of those strategies, of course, I want to talk about subject two and trusts and things like that, because as you know, uh, taking subject to 3% loans oh, yeah. uh, is a real benefit where interest mm -hmm. now interest rates are approaching 8% for mortgages. Yeah. Yeah. We were having a discussion about that this morning with some investors and talking about where, you know, we think it's going to go. And of course, you know, it's, I mean, who knows for certain, but chances are, if you've been around for a while, you see these trends. Right. Um, I, think and, it's gonna drop. I think it's where it's going to drop eventually mm -hmm. you know, over the next few years. Cause you know, what's fueling this inflation, right. what's causing inflation, high yeah. gas prices and supply chain issues. Right. So when those things slacken up, um, interest rates will come down. And plus, you know, we're going in, you know, we're already in recession, no matter how mm -hmm. you define it. Right. right two successive GDP losses. So mm -hmm. it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. And as the economy gets worse, the Fed is going to have to cut interest rates to stimulate the economy again. So right. I think this is a temporary thing. I don't think this right. is a long term. Right. But even even in a couple of years, I mean, we're looking at interest rates over 10 percent or more That's before awesome. it's done. You know, when I got started, when I started buying sub two, if I could find an interest rate below 8%. I thought that was fantastic. Of course, oh, that's 20 years ago. Subject to 11, 12% um, mm -hmm. VA FHA loans back in the early right. 90s uh, that were originated in the early 80s. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I was able to, you know, resell them and rent them and whatever. It's, people made money in 79 when interest rates were 18%, commercial 24. Right. Uh, it's not as good, you know, in mm -hmm. certain sense. I mean, it's hard at today's prices to finance at 8%. And rent it out and make a profit. I, I get that. Um, that's probably not a good strategy for today's market. Mm -hmm. um, it's also that prices haven't dropped yet to compensate for the high interest rates. It'll happen. Right. right. It'll happen. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, Steve said we, we had a closing attorney refuse uh, sending us funds without an account attached to the trust, regardless of sending him a pay proceeds letter. Yeah. When I used to close. I own an escrow company, so I used to do a lot of title closings. And if the seller signed a pay closing letter like that, they uh, they would cut the check. I would cut the check uh, to the beneficiary or trustee of the trust. Now, there's a couple of ways around that. You know, usually most title companies, 99% say we have to pay the seller on the closing statement. Nobody else. So if the seller is ABC Trust the funds have to be payable to ABC Trust. So here's your options. Number one, you can open an account in the name of the land trust, cash the check, move the money over wherever, and close it. Pain in the ass. Pain in the ass. Number two is, let's say the LLC is your beneficiary. So you go with the Secretary of State, you file a trade name called ABC Trust. And then you give that to your bank and you can cash it in your LLC account. And then you cancel the trade name. A mm -hmm. little bit of a pain in the ass too. The other thing you can do is uh, if you're the seller, why don't you just put on there like, um, you know, uh, uh, before closing, put a lien or a pay, a pay a payment and escrow demand to another LLC that's like a lender payoff or something so that the proceeds to the trust is zero. Yeah. <laughs> And everything else goes to the LLC as a quote loan payoff. Right. Yeah, that's that's great. I mean, super creative idea. Yeah, that's the, probably the simplest thing to do. Right. Yeah. Just record some type of, of lien yeah. against the property. Lien against the property in favor right. of your some LLC where you want the funds to go, probably the beneficiary of the trust. Mm -hmm. And then they get paid out, and then the trust um, gets no proceeds. Yeah. Okay. That's super. That's my first time hearing about that one. So yeah, huh. that's good. Not, not all title companies will do that. I know like in California, the escrow companies will do what's called a demand in escrow without a lien. Mm -hmm. A lot of title companies want to see a lien of record. So you may have mm -hmm. to report a mortgage or deed of trust. Right. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like really going back to what we said earlier, the safest thing to do is have your team. Then you control every aspect of this thing where you're going to close, what you're going to do. They know what you're doing and they don't question it. They yeah. Just... Having the right title company is like having the right wife. <laughs> it makes life a whole lot easier. <laughs> That's for sure. 
Uh, okay, sorry if this was already asked. Can you please clarify the difference between land trust and living revocable trust? Is it just semantics or is there actually legal difference? Well, a revocable living trust is a trust that a living trust is a trust created while you're living. That's a living trust. Uh, a revocable trust and living trust can be revocable or irrevocable. And like it implies, one you could change and one you can't. So a living revocable trust is a category of trust which are created while you're alive that can be changed or terminated or amended. A land trust is in that category, but there are other types of living revocable trusts that are used for estate planning and tax planning and so forth. So if you go to a title company and say, I'm taking title in my land trust, they're going to look at you like you have three heads unless you're in Illinois, Florida, or one of the common land trust states. If you say I'm taking title of my revocable living trust and don't use the word land in the title of the trust, you know, probably half the time you'll get away with it. And the other half will say, let me see the trust agreement. Mm -hmm. And then they'll say, this smells like a land trust. Can't do it. And then you have to figure something else out. Right. You know, and I hear talking about all of these things, maybe, maybe not. You, you know, this could happen. This probably won't. Uh, is it just easier in your opinion to use an LLC to take title and avoid trust totally? It depends if you're flipping or you're keeping. If you're keeping, you want to go directly into the trust right. and never have anything else go on title, especially mm -hmm. your own name. You know, mm -hmm. that, that's right. bad. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because you're in I mean, I, title history. I agree. I mean, we use a trust for every single thing. It doesn't matter if you're flipping. I mean, for me, even flipping it, whatever, I want my name off of everything. Uh, right. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's just, and that's what I say to some people. They say there's some confusion there. Well, using a trust avoids the do on sale clause. And that's not true either. No. Not the way we do it. Not the way we do it. Yeah. If you, if you own a property in your own name, like your primary residence, mm -hmm. and you put it in a land trust and you're the beneficiary, no, that doesn't trigger the do on sale. Right. But as soon as you change yourself to your corporation or LLC, right. that potentially does. Right. It just makes it less likely that the lender is going to catch it. Mm -hmm. And while we're on that topic, let's let's ask a question. I know everybody else is is already thinking. Uh, interest rates are going up. Do you think that increases the chance that banks are going to go? All right, let's start calling all these loans due. We know what these guys have been doing. We've been looking the other way, but now it's worth it to us right. to pull all of this money back in. What do you think about that? I don't think so. In the late seventies, early eighties, when this was when that was common practice, we were dealing with small savings and loans and you know small outfits who had a genuine interest. Right. Remember, now we've got servicing companies, third party, who deal with the customer and 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 aren't you know so there's a buffer between the lender and you. Right. Number two. Uh, you've got a lot of federal regulations now that are different than that, that require banks to keep a money reserve, a cash reserve, relative to the number of defaults they have in their portfolio. Right. So defaults are already way up. We know that because of the recession, because of you know, everything else, because of inflation, people can't pay their mortgage. So default rates are, have, have skyrocketed in the last year. Why would a bank want to increase their default rates? Exactly. And have to carry more reserve now if it goes up to 12 maybe maybe not maybe they do maybe they do right maybe. and you know it's, it's interesting I, an investor buddy of mine is out at some big conference in texas this week and we were talking this morning and he told me that they had some people in there sharing some information that wasn't public yet about at this point in time there are another three million loans that are in default and they expect that number to skyrocket after January when all the after holiday layoffs happen. Yeah, if the yeah. economy continues, that it is just going to be a bloodbath. Yeah, it is. The, the, yeah. This is going to get worse before it gets better in terms of the economy. And banks don't need more defaults on performing right. loans. For sure. Yep. Uh, can a revocable living revocable trust be used for personal property as well? Well, we have another type of revocable living trust known as a personal property trust that we do for things like owning RVs or boats, or if you have a note with a mortgage against a property that you want to hold in a personal property trust. Um, so the answer generally is yes. Okay. Uh, I want to ask, are you recommending to have a separated 
or I think you meant a separate LLC as beneficiary per property. Generally, no. I think that's overkill, uh, unless we're talking about you know a fourplex mm -hmm. or a ten-unit apartment building or a commercial property. Mm -hmm. so if you have eight single-family homes, especially like lower-end stuff, if you like, you know, Ohio or Indiana, uh, where each property might be two fifty or two hundred, you know, one per property is probably overkill. Mm -hmm. Maybe one every three, one every four. Uh, it depends where you are. If you're in California, it might be different because you, know, you might have a million dollar rental that's a 1,200 square foot, right. <laughs> three bedroom, one bath in the San Francisco Bay Area. You know, so then it might be worth it. I think you uh, you subscribe to the same theory I do. It's not about properties; it's about equity position. Yeah, it's so, equity risk. It's right. diversity of you know of the portfolio. I mean, right. there's no right answer. Mm -hmm. It, you have to look at comfort level, risk versus cost, aggravation, inconvenience, because every LLC needs a separate bank account. Right. Yeah. It can get complicated. It can get complicated. Yeah. Expensive bookkeeping. Yeah. Uh, so I get this right. The grand uh, guarantor, the original seller, trustee, someone in a different state, and beneficiary and LLC in the state the property's in. Guarantor? I think he means grantor. Yeah. Uh, I don't do it that way as the grantor is the seller and then assign it to me. I just create a land trust where my LLC is the grantor and beneficiary and my trustee is my trustee. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just go directly from seller to that trust. I used to do it that way where I made the seller the grantor mm -hmm. and then I assigned his interest to my LLC after I, I recorded the deed. I, I think it creates confusion from what I've seen yeah. later. Uh, I had a case like that where uh, a guy did that and my client 20 years later, his ex-wife came back and screamed, he still owns that property. He's been hiding it from the divorce. I want it. And I had to explain to her dopey attorney that now he assigned his members, his, uh, uh, his beneficial interest in the trust to my client 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And he just didn't get it. I had to explain it three or four times. Well, in doing it that way, it was because we started doing it that way a long time too. Then I don't even have to explain the trust to the seller. Right, when right. You, when, when you make them the initial beneficial interest and they have to assign it, it really gets confusing. And these right. people don't know what you're doing. Right. A confused mind says no. You got that right. Uh, let's see if we have another one. When searching the ROD, what document am I looking for that states an attorney has been attached to a foreclosure? Uh, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what you're talking about there. Um, I don't think that's relevant to the trust. I think what you're asking for the initial document filed at the courthouse when a foreclosure has been initiated, in most states that's going to be a list pendants. List pendants, or if it's a you know, trust state, it would be an, an NOD, a notice of default. Right. right. But in some states now, there's nothing like that. Listen, I remember the day that I proudly walked into the Bibb County Courthouse in Georgia with my Carlton Sheets course under my arm and said, I'm looking for the list pendants filings. And they said, what the hell are you talking about? And I said, well, when somebody starts a foreclosure, there's a list pendants filed. And they said, no, there's not. And I was thoroughly convinced they were lying to me. Turns out later, <laughs> nothing gets filed at the courthouse in Georgia. Right. There's a publication in the newspaper on the first Saturday of the month and for four consecutive weeks, and then it gets auctioned on the first Tuesday. So that right. can be different depending on what that state. Can be different depending on what state. And sometimes county by county in some states. Yeah, that's for sure. So right. when I did it in New York, uh, where I used to practice, it was uh, they did a list pendants. They did a mm -hmm. lawsuit, and then the judge appointed a, what's called a receiver to do the mm -hmm. foreclosure. Right. And I actually was a receiver a couple of times, appointed by the court, and conducted the auction. It was fun. <laughs> okay. All right. So naming a trust, what can you name a trust? Do you feel like there's a best policy on that? or? Well, for memory purposes, most of us uh, like to do the address of the trust, a 334 um, Lincoln Street Trust. Right. Um, I've had clients called it the, you know, the the charitable Catholic Children's Fund Trust or something mm -hmm. like that. They're really throwing people off. Um, you know, it's as you're in court going, you know, hey, judge, I represent the Children's Catholic Charity Trust. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, 
you know, there's, there's no rule as long as it's not a, a trade name that you're violating, like calling it the McDonald's Restaurant Trust, mm -hmm. um, then there's no problem. Right. Uh, I don't know how you feel about this. I tell my students, I don't recommend naming it after the seller. Oh, no. That can be, can present, you know, like yeah. misrepresent what's going on and can, can yeah. be a problem yeah. for you later. I had a client who did that for the purpose of insurance, made it easier mm -hmm to get, you know, the insurance amended or the new insurance, calling it, you know, the Smith Family Trust. Mm -hmm. So when they put insurance on the Smith Family Trust, the lender went, oh, Smith. Right. Um, you know, there was a reason for it logistically, but the problem is later on down the road, Smith might think that's his trust. Right. Yeah. And you're and you're not tricking the bank and the dual no. sale by that either. No, uh, no. The reason he did it was for insurance purposes. And, right. and that was smart. I mean, that was a good play. Yeah. But okay. uh, here's another question uh, that we get sometimes. Do trusts provide any asset protection? You know, interestingly, mostly not, because the rule generally is to the extent that you can get to the assets in a trust, so can a creditor. That's the general rule. Mm -hmm. So a revocable trust, if you could revoke it, the beneficiary, you know, can revoke it, then the beneficiary can give it over to a creditor. Now, um, in terms of lawsuit protection, meaning does it protect the beneficiary if someone gets hurt on the property? Uh, the general rules, no. However, um, I've seen in Florida by statute now, you can put the liability on the trustee. And of course, you'd use a corporate trustee if you did that. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's an interesting technique. And I, and I had a lawyer I met in Oklahoma who said that the law was set up there that, that way you could do that too, where he, he drafted the trust. So all liabilities on the trustee and he used the corporate trustee. I know that that's interesting. Right. Uh, but you know, the, the trust will protect you from certain types of liabilities. Like if there's, um, like an HOA lien, mm -hmm. uh, if it's in your name, you're responsible personally, not just the lien on the property. Um, a title claim for breach of warranty, uh, an unpaid contractor lien. A trust will protect the, the beneficiary from those types of claims, contractual claims. But negligence claims, people slip and fall, things like that, you're not protected from liability. So that's why you have the second layer being an LLC. Okay. Uh, Corey said, that's the way we've done it for years, Smith Family Trust. Well, and, and you know, for years I heard it taught that way as, as you know, additional... Well, I, I hate you know, use the term, you know, trick the bank on the due on sale. Yeah. And that and that kind of stuff. But I, I don't think they, they care about it. most of the people you're going to be dealing with or they're going to see that that new insurance paperwork or the you know, $12 an hour employees. They don't care. They don't analyze anything, really. Um, Inflation adjusted $15 an hour. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Evie. Uh, but yeah, Corey, I, I wouldn't do that. I, I would name it. That's what I did. I named it after the street because after a while, you buy three or four houses on one street. You want to keep it straight. You get confused. Yeah, that's right. You unless, get you have, unless you have a chart, like a like a, an Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> uh, Steve said, we own a property in Tennessee in a land trust because we weren't aware they may become a problem. Will we have trouble when we sell? Um. You may have to deed it out into your LLC before you sell it. I would talk to your local title representative and ask them, is this going to be a problem? So you may have to before, if you're getting ready to sell, deed it out of the a few months, at least 90 days in case your buyer's FHA. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to have a 90 day chain of title, uh, maybe deed it out from the trust to the LLC beneficiary and then sell it from the LLC. Not ideal, but um you know, it's less likely the title company is going to dig into the trust if it was, a, you know, if it's not the current owner. Yeah. Or find a title company between now and the time you want to sell that is a good really that. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Uh, Matt, if your parents have to go to a nursing home, should they use a non-revocable trust to make sure they don't lose property to pay nursing home bills? That's a long discussion. There's a look back period of between five and seven years in most states. Medicaid laws. Uh, and so, you know, when you do that, you trigger this, this look back period. Um, there's not an easy answer to that one. There are certain types of irrevocable 
um, Medicaid protection trust that attorneys will do. And I'm not going to tell you that's good or bad. I'm just saying if you'd like to research that more, if you think your parents are going to a nursing home in the next year, it's not going to work because there's a look back period of many years. Okay. Guys, y'all have a few more minutes uh, to ask your questions and then we're going to be out of here. So don't, don't miss this opportunity. Uh, Bill, tell everybody about your land trust course, what, what's included in that and, and what they can do with it. Yeah, I've had a land trust course. The first, the first edition I did was 1999, and now we're, I think we're on about a ninth revision of it. Um, it's got the forms, the deeds, the, the, the checklists, the, the explanations. I have a whole chapter on state-by-state state, things you have to be aware of in certain states. Uh, like Pennsylvania and Arizona and Tennessee and things like that uh, that you have to be aware of. Uh, it explains, you know, the whole theory of it, how to do it, how to pick a trustee, how to sign it, how to do the insurance change, you know, what happens if this happens, what happens if that. And I got a lot of great forms in there too. It just are really some really great forms for doing creative stuff as well as asset protection stuff with land trusts. Mm -hmm. All right. And you got, guys can get that at sub2landtrust.com. Uh, and uh, man, I highly recommend it. And it's it's uptown now. I probably got the first version in '99 when I got started. <laughs> He's all digital it's now, man. Yeah, you know, it's an updated version. It's instant gratification now. You 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 pay for it and you got it right then. Yeah, video, audio, you know, PDF workbook, right. checklist, downloads, you know, uh, forms in Microsoft Word. Yep. And then I have a 50 state you know, folder, if you know, when I say pull out a quick claim deed and do a transfer, I have all 50 state deeds. Up there. Yeah, that's right. You don't have to take the one that's in there and hope it works for your state or, or do what I did and use the wrong one and have to straighten it all out later. Because I <laughs> made a ton of mistakes when I got started and yeah. still made a bunch of money. So uh, let's see. Uh, Vincent said, do I need to open bank accounts under the name of the trust? Can I just keep using the bank account with the LLC that's the beneficiary? You could do the latter, but if you have a lot of properties, you might want to do is open one corporation, like an S corp or an LLC as a property manager. And then the land trusts hire that property manager to collect rents on all the properties. So all your tenants deal with one property management company that you work for. Right. And they can be the bad guy, the property yeah, manager. The bad guy. I was, I was a property good. manager for years, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you go by and they've got a dog and they're not supposed to have it. They're like, you know, you're not supposed to have that dog. I'm going to try to do the best I can with the owners for you. But, you know. Right, right, right. <laughs> uh, Farouk, Farouk said, does the course include the estate planning trust? For example, I pass to make sure none of my stuff goes no, to probate. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, there's, I, I tried to create like a living trust package you know that would be valid in all states and to be honest i don't think that's something you should do yourself that's not a diy if you're going to do a living trust have your have an attorney do it right um and then the living trust would own the master entity that owns the properties or owns the properties through trust mm -hmm. right can you set that stuff up for for someone bill so all i have to do is contact you and you can, you can get it done for them so, I pay a lot of money for a software program that does all 50 states, about 90% of the work, and then I just have to tweak it from there. Okay. Well, there you go. So just uh, just give Bill a call and uh, let him do that stuff for you. Uh, we don't have any questions at the moment, so we got a couple of minutes to talk about uh, your, uh, your workshop that's coming up. Yeah, great. Thanks. Yeah, I'm going to do a workshop. It's going to be online. Um, it's going to be three one-hour sessions or so, Friday night, November 11th, and then three one-hour or so sessions Saturday morning, November 12th. I decided to break it up because an all-day online workshop is a little painful, uh, to be honest. so I'm breaking it up a little bit. Um, it's going to be uh, a, a, a online like this, and uh, I'm going to be able to answer questions as we go. It'll be recorded, so you get a recording even if you can't make it. It's only $197, which is a steal. And it's called recession proof real estate investing. So it looks at, you know, what are the strategies that are going to work in today's market and then over the next few years. And then, you know, depending on whether the market's up, down, or sideways, what always works, what you should be looking for in the market as a strategy. A lot of it is mindset and strategy. And then there and then I talk about specific I specific techniques that I think are going to work in today's market the way it is in the, over the next year or two. Right. 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 Right
uh, for the next few years for sure. Oh, yeah. Subject to three percent loans all day long. Absolutely. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, question How much uh, do you charge to set up a land trust? I don't know. How much do you have? <laughs> <laughs> Generally, it's about, you know, five to $600, depending on which state it is. Okay. Or you can spend less than that and get yeah, a course. Get the course. Do all you want. I mean, it's it's the same forms. My assistant prepares them and I right. review them. And you, Vincent, you guys know that I'm not super smart, but I took his course and figured it out. Okay, so I think you guys can do it. <laughs> no, everybody who says I'm not super smart is a genius. You know, no, you are. I don't know. I don't know about that. I think uh, you're I, a genius. I, I think you're a genius too. I, 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 this goat talk and. All your little cutesy things you're doing. Your wife's doing a great job. She she's awesome. She really is. Yeah, she's she's. Uh, I don't know what I'd do without her. All right, guys. It looks like uh, we've uh, caught up on all the questions. So, uh, guys, we might wrap this up a little bit early. Any any final thoughts on trust, Bill? You want to share with everybody? Yeah. Just remember, when anyone says that's illegal, ask them for four words. What law is that? Exactly. Find me a law that says this is illegal, and they can never cite you. So the idea is, is getting someone who's informed and educated uh, and trained on this and uh, get the right players involved who, who get the game, and it, your life will be a whole lot smoother. Yeah, for sure. All right, guys. All right, Bill, thanks so much for being here. As always, we appreciate you. your time, and uh, we'll catch you next time. Thank you. All Thank right. You. Okay, guys, that is it for this uh, episode of Goat Talk. We appreciate you joining us today. Listen. If you want uh, the course with everything that you need to know about land trust, you can check it out, sub to landtrust.com. I got started with it. And uh, I mean, if I can do it, you can do it. Uh, it's just it's super inexpensive and it's got really everything you need. And uh, don't forget about the uh, creative workshop that uh, Bill's going to do. Uh, it's in a couple of weeks, first part of uh, November. So uh, you can go to sub slash creative workshop. Get signed up for that and be ready uh, for what's going to happen here uh, in the coming market. So, guys, appreciate you joining us. Don't forget to subscribe at sub2tv.com, and uh, we'll see y'all next Thursday. Y'all have a great week. Talk to some sellers. Buy some houses. Mm -hmm.